The Fall of Calvus, as written by Calvus himself. I am Paul Lux, and I have compiled his journals into this book. Altyra was victorious in the battle with Netza, and Queen Holly conceived and gave birth to Calvus. Calvus kept the surname of his mother, Frasia, for the sake of the prophecy. I will compile the journal entries of Calvus here in this scroll. From the earliest years of my youth, I remember my father's wise counsel. There was a day when I strayed from the palace courtyards and wandered outside into the city streets, and my father searched for me. When I was found, he brought me into the palace and reprimanded me in love. He never scolded me as a child, though I was foolish and wild. During the festivals of the kingdom, when all the rich people would come to dance in the palace ballroom, I would run around the ball to disrupt dancing couples. I desired the attention of those older than me. When I was reprimanded by my father, he would say to me, your actions now will help you grow to be the man you will be for the rest of your life. Remember this when you think about being the next king after I am no longer able. And I always held those words close to my heart. At the age of 12, I met a girl while playing outside the palace. I was running around the plaza to buy peculiar trinkets and objects for my room. The girl watched me as I ran about, and she approached me. She appeared to be poor, so I hesitated in allowing her to speak to me. But I remembered what my father said concerning the poor, that they are rich in heart. After I had run over to a certain shop, the girl came and stood behind me. I heard her voice from behind, saying, what are you doing, running around the street like this? Are you not from the palace? Aren't you the prince? I turned to face the girl who spoke with me, and I was immediately captivated by her glowing eyes. I said to her, if I'm a prince, why should I not be allowed to act how I want? And how can you, a commoner, have the courage to not only approach me, but question me as well? I am surprised. Then she bowed and said, I am sincerely sorry, my prince. Please forgive me. I will do anything as punishment for my offense. And I replied, very well, then. I will forgive your irreverence if you allow me to take you to the palace as a guest. After I said this, she was speechless for a moment. Then I said, what's your name? And she said, Glora, Glora Bellus, sire. Her words trembled. You have a good name. Will you come to the palace with me? I asked. Then she looked up at me again and said, I would be happy to. But you are the prince, and I am poor. Then I stood before her face to face, and I bowed to her. The crowd around us gasped, and Glora covered her mouth with her hands. I begged her, would you please come to play with me in the palace garden? You are very pretty. Now the girl had listened to me, and she followed me to the palace garden. The chief guardian of the palace came to me, saying, who is this girl? Why have you brought her inside the palace? And I said, am I not allowed to bring into my house whomever I wish? Do not talk down on me, for I am the prince. And the guardian, whose name was Hydron, showed mercy on me, and allowed me to take Glora with me to the garden. I showed Glora the bush I had been cutting that month in the garden. And she said, is this your artwork? I told her it was, and she replied, it is very beautiful. Then I took her to the river which waters the flower beds. We sat on the cobblestone pathway by the river, and we threw pebbles into the water. After that, we ran about the rest of the garden, as children do. After we finished playing in the garden, we sat together on a marble bench, and we conversed about our families and futures. I found that my heart was drawn to her, and I was beginning to fancy her. And when we were talking, I asked if she'd like a gift from my room. So I went to my room in the upper tower, and I found a necklace that was given me by my mother. Returning to the garden, I stood before Glora as she sat on the bench. I held the necklace behind my back, saying, this is a precious gift my mother gave to me a while ago. Then I revealed the necklace to her, and she marveled at the stone it contained, which was a royal oracalcum. She took it, and I helped her put it on her neck. So Glora and I spent the rest of that day together in the garden, and I had a guard escort her out of the palace and to her home at twilight. Now I sat alone in my room that night, and I spread my arms across the bed. My heart leaped for joy because I had met Glora that day. I was restless to speak with her again, so I set in my heart to wander the streets every day to see her again. The next morning, my father came to my room and knocked on the door, saying, Come to the dining hall. We have prepared a good meal for the royal houses. 
knowing that there would be many people from other kingdoms eating there, I was reluctant to go down. So I said, will the girl I met yesterday be there? If not, may I be permitted to ask her? And my father replied, if you can find her, it will be granted to her. I arose from my bed and left the chamber. Leaving the palace, I began to wander the streets of the city to search for Glora. I went to the same district where I had met her the day before, to the same plaza and the same market. I searched for her in the bazaar, and I saw her walking across the street to a stand. I ran up to her, saying, Glora. Glora. It's you. Then she turned to me with a shocked expression on her face. And the people around us gasped because I, the Prince of Altyra, called out to by name a lowly citizen. And Glora said, My lord, what is it you request of me? I replied, Do not call me lord. I want you to come to the dinner of the royal houses this evening. She paused, then said, Who am I, that I should attend such an event? And I said, My father the king has allowed it. He said that if I found you, then I could bring you with me to the dining hall. So Glora followed me back to the palace. That evening, I brought Glora with me into the palace dining hall, and the people of the royal houses had arrived. The rulers who were there were Emperor Xylus of Sedima, Princess Kisli of Senoa, King Hezen of Panerva, and King Geresh and Queen Undia of Grianara. When Glora entered the hall with me, the servants of the rulers all looked down on her in disapproval. And my father said to them, why portray such cruel expressions to this young girl? Is she not a person just like us? What person has control over what family they are born into? Cease to look down on my son's friend this way. Then Emperor Xylus said, so you have allowed this peasant to attend this night of elegance as one of us? And he replied, indeed I have. So Glora and I enjoyed the night and ate till our stomachs were full. I thanked my father for what he had done that night. Now I was about the age of 19, and I had begun training to be the next king of Altyra. My father taught me all the things he did in his chamber every night in preparation for the next day. My father was 206 years of age, yet he still gave me his attention, apart from his duties as king. Also, by this time the worlds had begun fighting against each other without cause. When I asked my father concerning this, he said unto me, The beast has touched the worlds, and that is why discord arises in their hearts to seek others to destroy. The beast which he mentioned is that great evil being called Infernos. I had read the account of Infernos in the palace library, so I knew what he spoke of. This made me constantly anxious of an impending destruction. My father had set me down in his office chair to show me his paperwork, and he opened many scrolls to lay them on the table. The scrolls contained peace treaties from the lands of Sedima and Senoa. I read through each of them, and my father taught me to sign each of them. As I was learning to sign the papers, I couldn't get the memories of Glora out of my head, so I was distracted. My father perceived that something was bothering me, so he said, why don't we take a break? For I can see that your mind is not fully engaged in your assignment. Because my father had given me a break, I told him what was on my mind, saying, I have not been able to get Glora out of my mind, so I have been thinking about being with her again. It has been many long years since I have seen her or spoken to her, and it is hard for me. I do not wish to live the rest of my life as if I had never met her. It has been five years since I have even seen her, and the memory of her has not left my mind, nor do I think it ever will. My heart burdens me, I miss her sincerely. And my father replied, very well, I will allow you to search for her. We know that the family of Bellus has moved to the east side of the city. Search there, and you will find her. I thanked my father, then departed from the palace. I put on common clothes, so as to not grab too much attention on the streets. I roamed the streets for about an hour, until I saw a man and his family from across one of the living districts. I approached them, because I could see that the woman with them was Glora. Approaching the man, I said, Sir, are you the father of the Bellus family? And the man and his wife, as well as Glora, bowed, and he said, I am, my lord. Then I said, allow me to dine with your family tonight, and I will pay you with good jewels and pearls. But he replied, let it not be so, my lord. You need not pay us for this, because you are the prince. Instead, we should pay you. I said, no, I wish to dine with you for the sake of meeting your daughter. And he replied, you are a gracious prince. 
So they took me with them to their home, which was in the back of that living district. I entered their house with them. And there they had already prepared a large meal for dinner. And I asked them their names, their names were Enoch and Jephabellus. It was a small yet comely home, and they had candles lighting the windows on each side. They had me sit at the end of the table, and Glora sat on my left side. They served wyvern meat with garlic bread on the side, as well as meat to drink. We talked and conversed for about an hour. When we had finished eating, I asked Glora about her dreams for the future. And she said, dreams? What do I, a lowly maiden, have to hope for in this world? I will follow the light in my heart until I reach the end and enter into Amnia. And I replied, yes, that is a good and perfect dream. But what do you wish to have in this life? But her father Enoch said, we have nothing to give her except that which we already have. We cannot give her any expectations of a wealthy future. Then I said, am I not the prince of this kingdom? And Glora said, I am content with what I have. Although lately I find myself wanting something new. She looked at me after she said this. After we talked for some time, there came a knock on the door. The Bellis family had set more bread on the table, so I continued to eat. Jetha got up from the floor and opened the door. The guards from the palace were there, and they said, We have come to ask the prince to return to the palace, by order of his father the king. I stood on my feet and said to them, I will stay here until I have finished eating. I still desire to spend time with this woman. Your father demands your return to the palace, they replied. But I would not obey their command. The guards left after that, and I sat back down to continue eating with Glora. Then they said, Why would you disobey the king just to stay with us? What have we done to deserve this? And I said, It is because I wanted to be with your daughter Glora. Then Glora raised her head and looked at me, saying, Thank you for your kindness, but I am not worthy enough of your time to warrant this. After we finished eating, I departed from their house and returned to the palace. I entered the throne room, and my father said unto me, Why did you not heed my voice and obey me? Have I wronged you in some way? And I said, Not so, father. But I desired to spend more time with Glora. Is that so? You would rather have dinner in a peasant's house than in our own palace, he replied. I replied, Father, have you not taught me to always consider the poor as richer than us? Why then do you speak this way about her? And he said, You have spoken rightly. Go now, you are free for the rest of the day. Therefore, I went to write in my journal in my room in the upper tower. When I awoke from my bed the next morning, I couldn't stop thinking of Glora and the day before. So I sat at my desk by the window and wrote a letter. I put the letter in the talons of one of the palace doves and sent it to Glora's house. I waited restlessly for a return letter. About half an hour passed and the dove returned with another letter in its talons. I eagerly opened the letter to read it. It was from Jephabellus, her mother, stating her thanks for eating with them the night before. I was slightly disappointed that Glora herself did not send a letter. Nevertheless, I was still content. I stashed the letter in one of the drawers of my desk by the window. I sent a second letter to Glora around noon, asking if I could take her on a walk throughout the city. This time her father responded for her, and the letter said that he had given her permission to walk with me. I rejoiced, and quickly found a cloak to wear. For I knew that if the Prince of Altyra was found walking with a common woman, it would cause an uproar. Now I came to the house of Glora, and I knocked on the door. To my surprise, Glora herself opened the door to greet me. She was wearing a dress made with leather, which I could tell was purchased at the tailor shop nearest to their district. Leather is a costly material for those in the lower class. Therefore, I knew she cared about the time we shared together, whether or not she only cared because I am the prince. I bowed before her, and took her right hand to kiss it, saying, may we walk together? She nodded, saying, yes. Throughout the rest of the day, from noon to evening, Glora and I wandered about the streets of Altyra. We talked about our childhood memories. I mentioned the memories I had of her when we first met, and she remembered as well. We went to an elegant restaurant, and I paid for her food. We sat inside and dined in the evening, and I talked with her about my fears of becoming the next king. After I spoke my heart to her, she said unto me, Allow me to fill your burdened heart, and I will give you rest. Don't feel so anxious for tomorrow, because I am with you here today. 
Let your thoughts be consumed by this moment, for this is a special day. And though the sun is setting, it is still not over. Her words gave me peace for the moment, and I sat by her to rest my head on her shoulder. The lighting of the restaurant was dim, and the lamps by the walls added ambience to the place. So I was at ease, and I could relax. After this, I took Glora back to her home, and kissed her hand. I said to her as she went inside, I will never forget this day. When I am alone and fearful, I will remember what you said, and my soul will find rest in your words and in the memory of your presence. After this, I returned to the palace, and I went to my room to rest. I could feel the burden on my heart being lifted. The dreadful day came, which I had feared all my life. My father laid on his bed in the royal chamber, and I sat by his side. I said to him, now I must be the king of Altyra, and handle the responsibility on my own. And he could not respond, because he was on the verge of death. So I bowed my head on the bed and began to cry. After I had finished crying, the servants of the king gathered around him, and they bowed with their swords pointing to the floor. Then my father took his last breath, and he died. So the fear of my grief was fulfilled. Then the guards wrapped him in a royal silver cloth, and they carried him out of the chamber. When the royal guard had finished preparing the funeral, they called for me to attend the event. I hesitated at first, because I was still mourning, and my heart was heavy. Nevertheless, I accepted the reality of the situation, and I went to the temple which was outside the palace. Many citizens came to attend the funeral, because this was a ritual for every king of Altyra. The funeral was a wretched affair. Everyone was wearing black sackcloth, and the stained glass windows of the temple seemed colorless. My father was dead, but all of the things he did for our kingdom will never be forgotten. As I sat there, awaiting the dreadful sound of the instruments, I began to reminisce on all the things I did alongside him in the palace. I remembered the day when I was out in the palace garden with father, and he brought me to see his hidden scrolls. He showed me all of his writings, which recorded the events of the Battle of Netzer. As I recollected these things, my mother knelt before the casket, and her tears became a river. The casket was decorated with gold jewels, and it had black engravings. My father's crown rested upon his hands, which were holding his chest. There was not one ounce of joy in the temple, only dark clouds that hovered over our heads. I began to remember all the legends my mother had told me concerning my father's endeavors. The story where he led the Ulteran army in battle against the Netzer kingdom, and the entire city of Netzer was burned to the ground. Then, when the smoke cleared, he ordered all of his aeons to clean up the rubble. Then he claimed that land for our kingdom, and we gained a second city after he rebuilt it. My mother Holly would often tell me stories of my father's youth as well, and all the times he would journey to the other lands, and would even cross the sea without saying goodbye. I remember when I was younger and my father would allow me to sit on his throne, and he would tell me that I would be king one day. Then he would say, always remember, my child, though you will be king, you must never let your heart be lifted up. For a proud heart will always fall, and the people will suffer because of your haughtiness. I sat there and remembered all the good things my father did for the kingdom of Altyra. He won almost every battle. Even though he was highly esteemed to be a good king, he never let his heart grow proud, and he never saw others as lower than himself. He even saw some of the peasants as higher than himself, for he said, they may have nothing according to material standards, but their hearts are far richer than mine. Now I am to be the next king of Altyra, and the people will look up to me. I must follow my father's footsteps in leading this kingdom. However, now that he's gone, I have no man to look up to as an example. I can only base my future actions on what my father might have done. Those memories kept playing over in my head as I sat there, the room being dead silent. Then the musicians came out, each of them holding flutes and lyres. As they began to play a slow melody, all the memories came back, and they played a gloomy dirge. And I began to go over it all, again and again. After the funeral was over, my mother and I returned to the palace, and she went into her chamber to mourn for two days. I also went into my room to mourn and to comprehend my future as king, but I only mourned for one day. I knelt before my bed and buried my face in the sheets. 
I wore black clothing and abstained from eating a single crumb of food. The entire kingdom also came grinding to a halt, and there was a week of mourning for the king. No one was joyful that week, and no children played on the streets or plazas. Now I came to my mother's chamber to have her listen to my inner troubles, after the week had ended. Preparations had already begun being made for my coronation the next week, and I was tormenting myself over the responsibility I would have. I said to my mother, why must I be king? If father had lived on longer, I would not have to take his place. I am not worthy of character to be the king of Altyra. I am no leader, and I still have not fully completed my training. The people will rely on me, and I will be expected to be like my father before me. I don't have the wisdom of my father, and I don't have his strength. I am of poor character, and I live for myself and not for the people. How then can I be the next king? How will I know how to handle the council, or how will I know when to send soldiers out, or to send out messengers and spies to other lands that may want to bring us down? What if the other lands, and the nations of them, plan to make war against us? I do not know how to command an army, and I have no loyal subjects or servants. I am the least of all the kings of Altyra before me. Behold, when I imagine myself beside the kings of old, I am nothing. When I finished venting my fears, I sat on a chair beside the bed and became silent. My mother rested her hand on my shoulder, and she said nothing. I could tell she cared for me, yet she said nothing because she knew nothing would lighten my burden. But I remembered the time I spent with Glora, and a slight sense of peace began to permeate my mind again. Now the day finally came when I was to be crowned the next king of Altyra. It was the day of the coronation, the first day of spring. I was about the age of 25, and I was still young. I trembled at the thought that I would now be held responsible for ruling this kingdom. My heart was burdened because of this. Nevertheless, I was to be crowned king of Altyra. I spent every hour before the coronation to prepare myself for this grand event. I remembered Glora, and I hoped in my heart that she would be there to witness my coronation. The Ulteran Council, which is responsible for surveying the commonality of the people, sent out an announcement of the coronation. A great multitude of citizens of the higher class came to the entryway of the palace gates. I walked out upon the balcony that stands above the gates, and the servants of the palace stood around me. Magar, a man highly esteemed from the Ulteran Council, was assigned to put the crown on my head. The servant behind me brought out a royal chair from the chambers, and he set it behind me. As I sat in the chair, I surveyed the multitude with keen eyes. I could not find Glora anywhere. When the trumpeters sounded their trumpets from the balcony, the multitude's rumblings began to quiet down. Then Magar stood to face the crowd, and he held up the crown which had been on my father's head. And he spoke thus unto the people of Altyra, citizens of this great kingdom, I stand before you today to crown your new king. This day the son of the departed king Ankajar shall take his place. Honor him sincerely with your citizenry, obeying his statutes. I know he is a good man. And though he is young, king Ankajar taught him well. He will be a good leader and king, and he deserves all reverence. Remember king Ankajar, who led this kingdom through the troubles of warfare with the evil kingdom of Netza. Behold now the son of that great man. His voice was strong and went out through the entire crowd. Then he turned to me, holding the crown above my head. And he said, Calvus Frazier, the moment this crown touches the hairs of your head, you will be king of Altyra till the day you die. Then Magar lowered the crown upon my head. He turned to the people and said, All hail King Calvus. And the multitude said, Hail to the king. Then the groups of servants and maids from the palace shot confetti from the edges of the walls of the gates, and the aeons shot fireworks into the air. The confetti reigned over the multitude of people, and they began to cheer. They began singing the songs that were sung to my father, and the sound of musical instruments permeated the air. It was a time of celebration for the people, but for me a time of uncertainty. When the celebration was over, I went to the throne to sit upon it. I felt a sudden surge of pride, and the fear of responsibility seemed to subside. Then I called my new servants, who had previously served my father and said to them, watch my throne while I go to my father's library. They immediately obeyed, and it gave me a sense of power, of which I had never felt before when I was the prince. 
I entered my father's secret library, where he had kept ancient scrolls and documents. I looked through them row by row and read each of their titles. And I came across the scroll of the Book of Netzer, which was surrounded by other newer scrolls. I began to read the scroll, and my attention to its story was undivided. And when I read in the scroll that Jesson, the palace scribe, had written it, I decided to speak with him. So I inquired of my servants, saying, Where is Jesson the scribe? I wish to speak with him, if he is still alive. And my servant answered, He has been living in one of the towers near the garden since the time of your birth. Therefore, I went to the palace garden to enter one of the towers that was attached to its walls. I went into the tower on the left side of the garden walls, and I found Jesson's room. The door was made of uncut wood and its knob was rusted. I knocked on the door, saying, It is I the king. After that there was no answer, so I opened the door, because the door was unlocked. And there was a man caught up in his writing which he was working on. Rows of scrolls and ink bowls were lined up on the table. I said to him, Are you Jesson, the scribe who wrote the book of Netzer? Then the man stopped writing, and he turned to look at me. He said, Calvus? Why have you come to visit me? Then I replied, I am now the king of Altyra. Why do you not show me more reverence? Then he said, Forgive me, old friend. For I remember when you were but a child. And my dearest friend, who was your father, would let me watch over you from time to time. Then I asked again, Are you Jesson? He nodded. I sat on the old bed by the table which faced the window. Then Jesson said to me, Why is your countenance sorrowful, and your soul burdened? I answered him, I am not ready to rule this kingdom. Though to be the king is a glorious thing, I find myself fearing it more than I find myself rejoicing in it. Yes, it is a heavy burden for me to bear. And Jesson said, Do not forget your father. Alfortia was a good man who put others above himself. Have I not written the acts of your father for this very reason? To comfort you in the hour of pain, and to guide you when he is no longer there to do so. That is why I wrote about him for you. Indeed, I wrote many things about your father and his endeavours, but I need not remind you of them. I wrote enough about him that you would know what he would do in your situation. It is true that I wrote the book not only for you, but for the people of Altyra as well. Thus, you should think more about the feelings of your people than of your own feelings. This is what your father would do, and what he would want of you. When he had finished speaking, I stood up from the bed to leave the tower. As I left, Jesson said one last thing, beware of the darkness. Your father never fell, but he stumbled many times. Set in your heart to never fall, just as Alfortsia. Now I had reigned for about two weeks. And one of my servants came to me with a message from the city of Nevery, saying, we rulers that were assigned by King Ankajar have found it difficult to govern the stubborn people of Nevery. We ask you to come and aid us in our attempts to regain control over the city. I said to the servant who told me this, I will be on my way. Prepare the rift gate for me. The servant left to prepare the gate. I went through the rift portal to the rift plain Enox. I arrived on Enox through the rift gate, which was set up outside the walls of the city of Nevery. As soon as I entered the Congress building, I approached the leaders of the city. They said to me as I entered the main room, Alas, the king has arrived. Please, help us govern this rotten people. So I helped them rule over Nevery that month. The Ulteran Council governed the kingdom while I was gone, because I had told them to do so. I ruled over the city of Nevery for about a month's time. When the leaders of the Congress were able to restore order to the people, I had a messenger of Nevery go to the Ulteran Council through the city rift gate, telling them that I would not return for some time. Then I embarked to the river of Ephraim. There I paid for a ship to cross the river, so that I could reach the city of Genshur. I came to Genshur, the elven capital of Enox, and roamed its paths. I had heard of the elves' peace which they had in Genshur, so I sought a place to meditate, so that I could come to peace with my grief. I found an inn which was part of a great tree, and the sign above read, Rifles Inn, in Elvish. I entered the inn, and the elf woman who stood behind the counter said to me, Greetings, King of Altyra. How long will you be staying? Only a few hours, I said. Then she replied, Is that so? You will not be sleeping here? Will you be meditating instead? I told her my situation, and I told her about the grief I was feeling. 
Then she said, Since you are the king of Old Tyra, I should not make you pay to stay under my roof. Lay in any open room you wish. I thanked her for her kindness as I entered one of the rooms. A group of elves came to the room I was staying in, and they had musical instruments. One elf held a lyre, one had a harp, and one held a mandolin. And the one who was leading them said to me, Greetings, King Calvus. I am Hyziel, and these are my servants. Allow us to comfort you with our words and with our songs. I said to him, You may do so, for I am burdened and grief-stricken. And the servant who held the mandolin sat on a stool beside the bed, and she began playing and singing a soothing melody. The elf who played the mandolin and sang to me was named Devorah. And as Devora sang to me in Elvish, Hyziel began speaking words of comfort to me. Devora's song reached the depths of my heart, and I felt at ease, if only for that moment. Hyziel said to me, We remember what your father King Ankajar did for us, how he defeated Nethash and saved our city from the hand of his kingdom. Truly, if it weren't for your father, we would be slaves in the kingdom of Netza today. Their evil king stretched out his hand that he might destroy us, that he might take our land. But the king of Altyra came to save us, and he sent his messengers as a harbinger of this. You are the son of that marvellous king. So stand tall and raise your head, for you are the king of the greatest kingdom of Arden. And now Nevery, the city established by your father, is a sister city to us, and they make trades with us selflessly. Your own father did all this, so be glad. The whole city shouted for joy when we saw the city of Netza fall, when its smoke arose and darkened the sky, and when the earth beneath us trembled. Then Hyziel continued, saying, Now relax on the bed, and let the sound of the lyre, and of the harp, and of the mandolin soothe your soul. They shall be medicine for you. Incline you ears to Devorah's calm singing. So Devorah continued to sing and to play the mandolin. Also, the other elves with the harp and lyre calmed my mind, as I laid down to rest. Peace finally began to comfort me, like a warm blanket over my shivering heart. As I drifted off to sleep, I felt my fears beginning to fade. I didn't feel as anxious anymore, and I came to accept that my father was dead. But I knew he was in Amnia, because he was a man who followed the light. It was Hyziel who reminded me of this. And this knowledge was what gave me the peace I was searching desperately for. I awoke, and it was still daytime. Two of the elves had remained by my bedside, Lebera, who played the harp, and Avizra, who played the lyre. And Lebera said, Has your heart found its peace? And I said, Yes, I began to feel better as I heard the sound of your music. Then Avizra said, Hyziel and Devorah have gone out into the city to buy food for you. Please, rest as long as you need, for Retel herself has allowed you to stay here without charge. The elf women played music for me till evening, and Hyziel and Devorah returned with much food. And Hyziel brought me a metal tray with many extravagant elven foods on it. It had lavash bread wrapped in leaves, gilderberries, elvish cakes, and crystal water mead. I ate the bread, the gilderberries, the cakes, and drank the mead. They filled my stomach and satisfied my flesh. Indeed, elven foods are very rare, and they are known for their exquisite flavors. And Hyziel said as I ate, enjoy all the food, for they were bought at high prices. Each item of food was worth about twenty pieces of silver. When I heard this, I was not surprised, for the food was almost perfect in quality and presentation. Once I finished eating, I said unto Hyziel and his maidens, I must go and return to my kingdom now, lest I linger on here because of the pleasures of the city, and I forget my own people. I thank you sincerely for your songs and your meal. For it was with great disappointment that I must take my leave. And they bowed before me as I left the room. Retel also bowed as I left the entrance of the inn. From there, I made my way back to the rift gate outside the city, and I returned to Altyra. I arrived in the palace through the rift gate. When the altar and council heard that I had returned, they ceased governing the kingdom. I returned to my duties as the king, and I started working on papers sent from other lands, as well as documents with relation to the council. Now around the third hour of working on my papers, a soldier approached me, saying, a peasant woman requested to be let into the palace, and we saw to it that she was repelled from the entrance. No lowly commoner should tarnish the floors of this place with the dirty soles of their feet. Then I replied, and did I order you to do this? Get out of my sight. I will deal worse with you than you have with her. 
Immediately the soldier went out from my presence. And when he returned, Glora was beside him, and she came before my throne, saying, My lord, I've had many dreams of you lately. May I stay in your presence today? And I said, Of course. My desire is that you treat this place as if it were your very own house. Now, sit beside me on my throne. Glora hesitantly made her way up the stairs to sit beside me on the throne. Then the other guards in the room said, Blasphemy. How dare a peasant woman, dressed in such filthy garments, come to sit with the king on his throne? Then I stood from my throne and said, Silence. You will not speak this way about her. Now, we will send you out to live in rags in the alleys of the edges of the city, and you shall eat the dirt off the floor of your house. I gestured to the other guards, and they took a hold of the ones who spoke against Glora. And I had them take them out to the city, and they lost their rankings among the palace servants. They looked down on the poor, and now they themselves were among the dregs. Then I said to the others who remained in the throne room, Do any of you also look down on Glora with haughty eyes? Make it known to us if it is so. And they all stood in silence. I could sense they were conflicted. A guard who stood near one of the pillars stepped forth, and he said, We were raised up in this place since your father was king, and he said the same things as you. But he never released a guard to make known his values. Nevertheless, if the king wills that a peasant be allowed in the palace, it shall be done. We have no complaints. Then I said, send out a proclamation to the city. I will speak to the masses concerning this matter, and I will remind this kingdom of my father's values. Then I turned to face Glora, and I said, Glora, you shall stand by me as I make my speech, and the crowd will see with their own eyes proof that what I say is true. And I arose from the throne and began heading toward the balcony above the palace gate. There I waited for the crowd to increase in number before the gates. And when the crowds arrived, I began to speak. I said, People of Altyra, hear my voice. You who are of a higher status, you who live around the walls of the palace, do not treat the poor as if they are lower than you. The residents of the outer living districts are people just like you, and many of them are even richer than you. Their hearts are full of humility. Yet the rich are made proud by their riches, and their ambition controls their mindset. Do not let yourself be lifted up in pride, for it has hardened your hearts, and this will be the prelude to your downfall. I brought Glora in front of me to show her to the crowd. And I said, see this beautiful woman, I have loved her with all my heart, yet she is indeed a peasant woman. But this means nothing to me. Therefore, let none of you look down on another person based solely on the amount of their riches. I ended the speech and returned with Glora into the palace. Now when we entered the throne room, and Glora sat by me on my throne again, she said, My lord, my king, what you've done today is truly more than I deserve. I am nothing but a poor woman, and yet you have shown me unconditional love. Let me offer up all my possessions, so that I may give you all that I have as a gift. Then I replied, No, my love. You must keep what you have. The only gift I need from you is that which you have already given me, your heart and I would never accept the possessions of a woman who already has nothing, I would never stoop so low. And she said, O oh Calvus, you are truly a good man. And she rested her head on my shoulder. My heart felt lighter, and we talked until midnight. After we had finished talking, when the full moon was in the middle of the sky, I arose with her and walked her to her house. Then I returned to the palace to rest. I was busy doing paperwork for the council one morning, and one of my servants came into the chamber panting. I could see he was very afraid. Then five of the other guards rushed over to the doorway to speak. And they said, Sire, a great battle is arising between the lands of Anarek and Panerva. Then I said, What of it? If they choose to fight each other, let them fight. Their affairs do not concern me. But they said, No sir, but we have a word of warning from Beshtharba that the Panavan army is planning to conquer Altyra. Immediately I laughed, saying, Panerva will conquer Altyra? They have lost their minds. Bring the generals of the army to me. So they went to bring the generals of the army to me. Now all the generals of the army were before me. And I said to them, We will go into battle with Hezen and his army. He thinks he can take our kingdom. How is this different from the kingdom of Netza which my father destroyed? What King Nethash was to my father, King Hezen is to me. Now gather your warriors and prepare them for battle. 
But first I wish to be with Glora before I go, then I will return and go with you to the land of Anarek. They bowed and left the chamber. Once I finished my paperwork, I wrote a letter and had it sent to Glora's house. In the letter I asked her to come to the palace to see me, stating my plan to spend time with her on the rift plane Pyra. About an hour and a half later, Glora entered the throne room, dressed in her leather dress. And I stood from my throne, saying, you look stunningly gorgeous. And she bowed. Then I said, come with me, I have a gift for you. And she followed me to one of the chambers behind the throne room, the closets and wardrobes. I picked out a white dress for her to wear, and I handed it to her, saying, I want you to wear this, for when we walk about the forests of Pyra. Then she replied, you would allow me to wear something made in the palace? After she changed into the dress, the two of us left the wardrobe and went through the palace rift gate to arrive on the world of Pyra. The landscape of Pyra was breathtakingly beautiful, truly a marvel to behold. We came out through the rift gate that stands between the towns of Okunai and Soksan. Surrounding the towns in the distance were steep cliffs and mountains, and forests of purple cherry blossom trees. Glora's eyes filled with wonder, and she said, if I had never met you, I would have never been able to leave Altyra and see such an amazing world as this. Then I turned to her and opened my hand to hold hers, saying, may I? And she placed her hand in mine as we walked through the paths between the towns. We reached the outside of the towns before we made our way through a small bamboo forest. As we walked and talked through the forest, we came to a grove of cherry blossom trees. I thought it would have been the best place to reveal my whole heart. My heart fluttered in her presence, and my love for her deepened, for we had spent half an hour sharing our hearts with each other. Now I knelt before Glora in the midst of the cherry blossom trees and prepared my mouth to speak. And she said, My love, what is it you wish to say, that you must bow before me? Then I raised my head to look into her eyes, saying, I make this promise to you today, that I will indeed defeat the Panavan army myself, and after that I shall return to the kingdom and marry you. We laced our fingers together, and I stood to my feet. A cool breeze passed through the air, carrying cherry blossoms, as I held her close to my chest. And I said, falling in love makes a man blind. Thus, I need someone to be my eyes. Will you be mine? And Glora shed a tear, saying, yes, I will be yours alone. I will be your queen, and I will die with you in your glory. Then we will be one for all eternity. The day passed quickly, like the wind. And as it grew darker, we returned to the towns in the plain of the valley and went through the rift gate. Returning to the palace, I said to Glora, allow me to spend one last hour with you here, then I shall walk you home. I could spend seven hours with you, and I would never want to leave, she replied. So we spent one last hour together in the chamber before the rift gate. Then I walked her to her house in the living district. I said, you will not be poor for much longer. Wait for me, as she closed the door before me. I returned to the palace and slept like an infant. It was the day that we would go to battle with the Panavan army. I had my generals gather their armies from the west side of the city to stand before the north side of the palace. And I said to the armies with a loud voice, we embark to the land of Anarek this day. When we reach the city of Teravan, we will spare no man, no woman, and no child. We will burn down everything in sight, till we reach the shores of the ice sea. Then I raised my right hand and shouted, go. The armies pointed their spears and swords into the air, responding with a resounding, hail. I called my servants and said, prepare for me my royal chariot, for we shall march on foot to the land of Anarek, and the journey must be as short as possible. Indeed, the mountains will be tough to traverse with 9,000 soldiers and aeons. So I had my servants prepare my royal chariot, as well as war chariots for the aeons and foot soldiers. Then we sent out the chariots to the soldiers outside, and each general sat in one of the larger chariots. Thus, we embarked and began journeying to the land of Anarek. We travelled as fast as we could through the mountains of Altyra, and we reached the plains of Anarek in just over a day. As the sun began to rise the next day, we arrived before the plain of the city of Teravan. And the people in the land heard the rumbling of the earth which our chariots created, and they trembled and cowered and fear. But they sent out their militia from the center of the city, and they grew in number on the plain. They had aeons and archers, and they had warriors who wielded maces and clubs instead of swords and shields. 
When I had set my sights on the army of Teravan, I shouted to the generals, Make war! And the generals charged toward the army in the plain of Teravan, and their subdivisions of soldiers followed after them. And I shouted again, Destroy everything on the plain, leave no person alive in your trail. My armies utterly destroyed the armies of Teravan. Flashes of light permeated the battlefield, and my aeons overpowered the aeons of the Teravan army. After the Teravan armies were wiped out, my troops raided the buildings of the city and slaughtered those within them. And my aeons set the city ablaze with art light. Then I called the generals to my chariot and said to them, Go and burn down every town, every village, and any city in a ten-mile radius to this city. Leave no one alive, scorch their flesh to ashes. So they went out into the land to wipe out the cities of the plain. Now I ordered my generals, and they ordered the soldiers to gather at the shores of the ice sea. There on the shores of Anarek lay a group of towns, each having docks with large ships. And I ordered each general to go out into one of the three towns to raid and pillage them, so that they may take hold of their ships. As I rode on my chariot on the outskirts of the towns, I shouted to the generals and soldiers to take coats from the town shops, for the waters of the ice sea are indeed very cold, and when the wind blows, the sails freeze. And because it was nightfall when our battle began, the air was all the colder. After the docks were raided, and the people of the towns were taken away, the soldiers boarded the ships. There were about twenty-five ships combined from each town. The foot soldiers who remained on the shore lined along the sand with their shields and swords and spears, in case the Panavan ships would reach land, and somehow bypass our ships. As I watched the ships set sail to sea, I also saw the Panavan ships growing larger from the distance. They were approaching with great haste. Once they had sailed close enough to my army's ships, the Panavan ships began firing cannons and mortars at them. The two groups of ships shot cannons at each other, until all my soldiers' ships were sunk. Then one of my generals ran to my chariot, saying, Sire! Sire! What shall we do now? The Panavan army has much greater artillery than us. If they attack us from their ships, we are doomed for sure. But I corrected him, calm your nerves, Cyril. Behold, I have brought some of my strongest aeons from the palace here. At this moment they are on their way from the towns we burned and pillaged. When they arrive, they will leave neither skin nor bone of the Panavan soldiers. When the Panavan ships touched the sands of the shore, their soldiers stormed out of them, and we braced the attack. About half an hour passed before the Aeons arrived from the other towns, and the soldiers on the shore impaled each other with spears and halberds. When the Aeons arrived, dressed in black leather cloaks, and each of them wearing a different colored mask, they lined up behind the backs of my soldiers. They lifted their hands into the air, and holding their other hand at their chests, they summoned a great barrier of art light between my soldiers and the Panavan soldiers, so that their attack would not take any of my troops. Once they could see that our troops were safe, they all clenched their fists in the air, and lightning stuck from above, wiping out many of the Panavan soldiers. And after my soldiers had killed the remaining Panavan foot soldiers, the sands of the shore were stained with much blood. Then the rest of the Panavan ships arrived from behind the others, and their soldiers charged out onto the shore. With them came new Panavan Aeons, who could combat in equal power with my Aeons. So I retreated to my chariot to think over what my next action should be. Now I had returned to my royal chariot and had entered to sit down behind the curtain. As I was about to give the call to retreat, looking out the window of the carriage, I spotted a messenger running through the crowd of soldiers. And the soldier asked to see me in my chariot. I allowed him to enter, and he said, Lord, I've come from the aerodrome of Beshtharba to tell you this, that the palace has been infiltrated by a group of Anarek assassins. Lo, they have kidnapped your lover Glora. Immediately I was in a panic, and I said to the messenger, with haste I take my leave from the battlefield. I go to Beshtharba to return to my kingdom. After I said this, I pulled on the bridle of the chariot's horses, and I escaped the battlefield. In about two hours, I reached the aerodrome in Beshtharba. I parked my chariot outside the airship port and paid them to guard it. I boarded a smaller airship so that I could reach Altyra faster. The airship landed in the aerodrome of Altyra, which is centered in the northwestern quadrant of the city. From there I took a chariot and returned to the palace as quickly as possible. I entered through the northern entrance, which is hidden behind a silver brick wall. 
I searched through the halls of the palace for Glora, sprinting through the rooms and chambers. I knew she had been resting in the palace before I left for the battle, so I searched desperately through every last room of the palace. But alas, she was nowhere to be found, and my heart almost failed me. As I was panicking, running through the hall that leads to the door behind the throne room, I heard the sound of one of the armor stands crashing. Behind the door next to the armor stand, I found an assassin hiding in the corner of the room. As soon as I saw the man, I charged toward him, unsheathing my royal sword. As I revealed my sword, he threw a hunting knife at me, but it bounced off my spalder. I seized his neck with my hand and dragged him out to the throne room. I asked the man, where are you from? Who are you, and who sent you here? The man said, I am an assassin from the land of Anorak. Please, spare my life. For, you see, I was hired by one of your own people to assassinate you in your royal household. And I gnashed my teeth at him, saying, would I spare the life of any assassin? You have lost your mind, you filthy creature. Show me where you have taken those who were in the palace. I demand answers. After that, he did not speak to me, but his body trembled in the fear of my presence. I then placed the blade of my sword above his right shoulder, and he began to speak again. Your lover has been escorted outside the palace. They are taking her outside of the kingdom, he said. Now that I knew where to go, I diced the assassin into pieces, then took off to catch up to Glora's captors. When I exited through the palace gates, I could see the chariot moving far down the main street of the city. With all my strength, I ran down the wide street to catch up to the chariot, which was gaining speed as I moved toward it. Eventually, they reached the gate of the city wall, and I got close enough to see the emblem on the back of the chariot. The emblem was that of one of the kingdoms in the land of Anorak. I reached for my sword on my left thigh and unsheathed it as I ran to the chariot. The men driving the chariot turned to see me, and they were wearing black masks. In the back of the chariot, they had Glora in a cage, and she was bound in chains. I entered a blind rage, and the men tried to escape as I thrusted my blade into the driver's side. I reached my left hand out toward the two who were running to the gate, and I set them ablaze with blaze art light. The other three ran to hide in one of the buildings on the one side of the street. I took the sword out of the driver's side and ran inside the inn to find the others hiding behind a corner of one of the rooms. Before they had the chance to ambush me, I knew where they were, so I struck them down. I took the bodies of the three men and the driver and put them in the back of the chariot behind the cage. I blasted the lock of the cage with blaze to free Glora from her chains. As I broke her chains, she spoke to me with tears, saying, Calvus, my lord. You came. I cried out for you when they invaded the palace, and they lashed my back to weaken my resistance. And after I relinquished her from her chains, I held her hands in mine and said, Be at peace, I am here. I promise I'll find whoever is scheming against this kingdom, along with the Panavan army, and bring both of them down. We'll be victorious in this war. And she said, I trust in you, my love. And since you have returned from the battlefield, does that mean you have defeated Hezen's army? I replied, I do not know. I fled the battlefield when I heard that you had been kidnapped. Then she said, I was afraid Giltz would have been killed before he could reach the aerodrome to tell you. But you received his word, and you reached me just in time. And when I asked her what else they did to her, she told me how the assassins bound her in chains in the basement of the palace and questioned her. The assassins were sent from the land of Anorak to kidnap her because they had heard we were going to marry. Why they would have gone to such lengths for this reason, I still do not understand. Now I had taken the chariot outside the city, and I burned the bodies of the assassins in a pile in the grass. After this I returned to the palace with Glora, and I laid her down in my bed to restore her health. That evening, I reprimanded the palace servants for not being able to protect Glora in my absence. I had the palace maids prepare strong potions for me to have Glora drink. And once the servants had left my room, I sat by the side of the bed to comfort Glora the rest of the night, and I had no rest. Throughout the night, I thought over my actions of late. I began to see that the darkness had found its way into a corner of my heart. But this did not concern me, because I had done these things to protect the love of my life. I would give up even my own sanity if it were for Glora's sake. However, the darkness inside began to bring a subtle constant pain under my veins, and I could feel it all day. 
When the sun finally rose the next morning, I watched Glora as she woke from her slumber, and I had my servants bring her breakfast to eat in bed. And Glora said, the potions you gave me to drink yesternight have cured me, and I feel as though nothing had ever happened. And I smiled, saying, that brings me great peace. How have you enjoyed sleeping in my bed? And she replied, it is a very comfortable bed, and I find it difficult to leave it. Then I said, I have prepared one of the chambers in the palace as a room for you. From now on, until we marry, that room is yours. Then she replied, you would do such a thing for a peasant like me? But I said, you are no peasant in my eyes, darling. No, but you mean more to me than all the peoples and lands of Arden. And your beauty is radiant, so bright, the stars are ashamed to give their light. Throughout the rest of that day, I set up Glora's room in one of the palace chambers in the hall behind the throne room. She would stay there until the two of us were to be wed, and before she would become my queen. However, later that day, I received a letter with the stamp of the altar and council on it. The letter read, To the king, we know that you have granted the right to live in the palace to your fiancé, who is a peasant. We request that you release her from the palace and have her return to her family's house. Once I finished reading that wretched piece of paper, I rolled it up and threw it away. When Glora asked what it was, I answered, it is nothing worth giving thought to. Once we finished setting up her room in the chamber, we continued to spend the rest of that afternoon talking. After the Battle of the Ice Sea had ended, the Ulteran Council announced that we had lost, and that the Panavan army had wiped out all of my troops. I was sitting on my throne when I heard this news, and it angered me to the core. When my time to sit on the throne was done for the day, I stopped by Glora's room before heading to the chamber to do paperwork. I knocked on her door, and she opened it, saying, have you gotten time off? I replied, all I have left for the day is paperwork. Then I said to her, after I finish my paperwork, I will go down to the Ulteran Council and speak to them concerning what has happened to my army. Now I had finished that day's work, and I set out to confront the Ulteran Council, which is set in the center of the southeastern quadrant of the city. I entered through the large doors of the council hall, and I went into the meeting chamber, where the members of the council were awaiting their next session. When I had gotten the court's attention, I said to them, if I could have your attention, gentlemen of this council. You were the ones who informed me of the approaching armies of Panerva, yet you took no precautions, and you did not make alliances with the lands near us to help aid us when the battle came. Now I am considering what your recompense should be. After I said this, one of the court members said to me, why should we, the supporters of the king, be responsible for making alliances with other nations? We are not the king, but you are. If you believe that we would have been victorious that way, why then did you yourself not write treaties of alliance with the land of Grianara? You could have written them, and we would have sent them to the cities in the mountains of Grianara, so that they might have aided us in this battle. And after a couple of the other men spoke against what I said, another man came down from his chair to approach me. The man's name is Puluvius, and he is a man highly esteemed in the Ulteran Council. The people of the kingdom respect him and his judgments greatly. Puluvius said to me, Greetings, Your Highness. I am Puluvius, though I'm sure you've heard my name before. See that the entire kingdom is on my side, to make me their ruler. Indeed, I seek to be the next king. I will be a good king, who seeks first the well-being of the economy and military of Altyra. And I will be king, for even the rest of the council can see that I am more fit for the throne than the son of Ankajar. When I heard this, anger quickly arose in my heart, and I felt a surge of pain rush through my veins. I knew it was only my inhibitions that were holding me back from striking him down. As he was about to speak again, I turned my back toward him and left the court chamber. I didn't pay attention to what he was saying as I left the council. That night, as I was lying in bed to go to sleep, I heard a knock on the doors. When I opened them to see what it was, the guard gave me a letter with the seal of the council. I returned to my bed, and I lit one of the lamps so that I could read the letter. The letter was from Puluvius, and it read, Greetings, Your Highness. I hope you enjoyed your trip to the council this afternoon. I am writing this to inform you that I have gained support from the people of Altyra in large numbers. They believe I am a wiser man than you, and they wish that I would take the throne. I do not blame them, because you have not done right in their sight. Indeed, they now seek to make me king. I am giving you the next seven days to step down from the throne. 
If you will not cooperate with me, then the people will turn against you all the more. If you do not want civil war in Altyra, then it would be wise for you to relinquish your kingship. I finished reading the letter enraged, so I tore it to shreds and went to sleep. The next morning, I called the masses to the front of the palace to give a speech. I said unto the people of Altyra, I have heard from the Altaran council that many of you oppose my place on the throne, and that you wish for Puluvius to take my place. If it is true, let the people say so. After I said this, most of the crowd shouted, raising their fists in the air. Then I continued, saying, What then have I done to you, that you would have Puluvius take my place? Have I not served you well enough? I know my father was more fit for the throne than I, but I was placed on the throne much earlier than intended, and now I must govern this people on my own. Then one of the men standing close to the gates below the balcony shouted, You are not on your own. You have the help of the council. How can you complain? I responded, I say I am on my own because the council has not helped me. When we were fighting against King Hezen's armies, the council did not seek aid from the other lands. And when I had heard that my fiancée was kidnapped from the palace, I had to escape the battlefield to save her. Where was the council when those assassins invaded the kingdom? As I continued to speak to the crowd, they began to speak amongst themselves, as if I were not speaking to them. Seeing their disinterest in what I had to say, I gave up on reasoning with them, and returned to my chamber. Later that afternoon, while I was sitting on the throne, my guard said to me from the doors, a chair member of the council is here to speak with you. I knew who would come through those doors if I told the guards to open them. Nevertheless, I said, let him in. When the guards opened the doors, there was Puluvius, walking with his head held high. His putrid and proud heart showed in his countenance, and it made me sick. Puluvius knelt at the foot of the stairs to my throne. Then he was about to speak, but I said, you may speak. He opened his mouth and said, your highness, I do not think your decision to have a speech against your own people was wise. I interrupted him as he was saying this, and I said, why do you refer to me as, your highness? Let your heart be the source of your words, not the mask you council members all wear. When I said this, I saw him clenching his jaws. Puluvius continued and said, Calvus, why have you stirred up the anger of the people? I have already made it known to you that they are not on your side. Then I asked him, and are you on my side? Speak with honesty, let it be known to us. He replied, I do not believe you are fit to be the ruler of this great kingdom. After he said this, my mouth failed me to speak. I gazed down upon him with murderous intent. I knew this was wrong, so I stayed put on my throne. I thought about Glora, and our upcoming wedding. If I were to have killed Puluvius there, things would begin to degrade even more than they already were. You may leave my throne room at once, I said. Then he stood up to his feet and turned to leave the throne room. As Puluvius was walking down the hall, I had the sudden urge to shout at him. So I shouted at him, saying, Puluvius, chair member of the Altaran Council, you are hereby banished from the kingdom of Altyra. I shall never see your face again. To my surprise, he replied, as you command, your highness. So he left through the palace gates. Soon after this, I began hearing the shouts and angry cries of the people from outside the palace. I got off the throne and left the palace to see what the commotion was about. I was appalled at the behavior of the people. They had seen Puluvius preparing to leave the kingdom, and that had enraged them. Therefore, I made the decree that Puluvius should stay in the kingdom. However, the people still hated me from that day on. I returned to the throne after this, and the day went on as usual. The day after this, two men approached my throne. They told me they were the sons of Puluvius. The one on my right had dark curly hair, and his name was Paul Lux. His brother had longer and lighter hair, and his name was Castor. Castor spoke first, saying, King Calvus, our father has made it clear to you that you do not deserve the throne. As soon as he said this, I chose not to listen to him. He continued to disrespect me in my own palace. After he finished his charade, his younger brother Paul Lux began to speak. And Paul Lux said to me, My king, forgive my father and my brother for the things they have spoken against you. Their words are not founded on truth. When you went into battle with the armies of Panerva, you were alone in leading them, save the few generals you had. I appreciate your effort in trying to take your father's place. I believe you will be as great as your father one day.
if you choose to not let the baseless words and actions of my father and brother anger you. Forgive me if I seem to be putting myself above you, for that is not my intention. After they spoke their minds to me, both of them left the palace. Now the time had come for me to arrange my wedding with Glora. Glora had been living in the chamber I assigned her to, and she had been visiting me every night to speak with me. While Puluvius and the council were distracting me from her, I began to miss her, even though she would see me every night. But that wasn't enough for me. Being able to arrange our wedding together and spend more time with each other again was cathartic. Glora and I finished arranging our wedding ceremony, along with the feast which the royal house would participate in with us. A high member of the council named Eluha was assigned to wed us. I knew Puluvius, along with other members of the council, would be vexed to discover that I was marrying a peasant woman. But I gave no care, because I see neither the rich nor the poor. The wealth of a person does not determine what value they have in themselves. The poor in heart are the ones who are void of worth. But Glora is rich in heart. That night I announced the news of our wedding to the kingdom. The day after this, the members of the royal house and of the council prepared the upper balcony of the palace gate for the wedding ceremony. Meanwhile, Glora and I were changing into our outfits for the ceremony. After I had finished putting on my garments, I stepped onto the palace balcony, where I could see the masses of the kingdom cheering at my appearance. I awaited my bride and my queen with great anxiety. And behold, there she was, adorned with marvellous splendour and beauty. Her dress was angelic in appearance, and her countenance was pulchritudinous. Her hair, like the waves on the shore reflecting the light of the sun as it sets, flowed gracefully with elegance. Her captivating eyes, like golden flames, captured my heart as my eyes were lost in her pure beauty. Her brunette skin glistened in the radiance of the sun. She walked slowly up the stairs to the balcony, arm in arm with her father Enak. At last, Glora was to be my bride and my queen. Iluha reached beneath his robes and pulled out of his breastplate a prayer medallion with the face of Toniel engraved on it, and he raised it in the air. Then Iluha said unto the people, Behold, our king has taken a wife, and she shall be your new queen. When the people heard him say this, some of them began shouting against our marriage. And Iluha began praying aloud to Toniel for him to bless our marriage. When he had finished praying for our blessing, he put the medallion away in his breastplate and turned to face Glora and I. Glora and I held each other's hands, and I could see a tear streaming down her left cheek, which glistened in the sunlight. Now it came time for us to say our vows, and Aluha said, Calvus Frazier, do you swear by your life to always stay true and faithful to this woman till the day you die? I do, I replied. Then he said to Glora, Glora Bellus, do you swear to always be by this man's side till the day you die? Glora said, I do. And with those beautiful words, Iluha said, Let the king kiss his bride. Alas, I gently swung Glora towards me, and we shared our first kiss. As we kissed, I could hear the tension in the masses. Many of them were cheering, but I could also hear many of them becoming angry. After we parted our lips from each other, Magar came from beside Iluha, and he placed a beautiful crown on Glora's head. And when the crown had touched her head, Magar shouted to the people, All hail Her Majesty. Queen Glora of Altyra. The people gave a great cheer, but some argued amongst themselves. For the rest of that night, after our wedding, Glora and I retired to my chamber, which I could now share with her. And for the next two weeks, the two of us spent every day and night getting closer to each other. This is a custom that every king of Altyra has kept. And while the two of us were gone from our duties for those two weeks, the Alteran council handled those matters in our place. It was also during this time that Puluvius began to turn my people against me. Glora and I had spent two weeks together, and our souls had bonded, as though they were one. However, with the creation of something so beautiful and holy, something equally terrifying happened in the third week after our wedding. I had prayed to Toniel many nights in the past that I would never have to endure such grief again. Even now as I write this, the tears return as I remember this dark season. As Glora and I were preparing for bed one night, one of my servants came to the door of our royal chamber. As I got up from our bed, Glora sat up from the covers, and she said, My love, do you find it odd that someone would have such an urgent matter that they be required to speak with you so late? And when I had opened the door, there was one of my maids weeping, covering her mouth with her left hand. 
And she said to me, Your Highness, I feel exceedingly guilty being the one who must bring this news to you. The queen, your mother, is on the brink of death, and the alchemists were not able to heal her in time to save her. If you wish to speak to her one last time, then hurry as quickly as you can to her chamber. Without hesitation, I ran up the main stairway to the top of the palace tower, where my mother's room was. Glora and the maid also followed me up the tower. I gave no care that I was still in my nightwear. I entered my mother's chamber, and when I saw her lying there, trying to breathe, my heart felt as though it had fallen out of its place. Memories of my father's funeral resurfaced in my mind. Several of my maids were standing around her bed, and they all kept their heads down, hiding their tears. One of the maids on the right side of her bed came to me and said, Lord, do you wish for us to leave, so that you may have this moment with her alone? And I replied, Two of you may stay, for I do not wish to endure this in solitude. The two maids who stayed were named Mira and Jashra. Mira, the one who spoke with me, returned to my mother's bedside, then I knelt before her bed as well. I held her hand in mine, and Glora laid her hand on my shoulder, and she began to weep. I tried to hold back my tears, so that I could look strong for my mother. Then my mother tried to speak, and she said to me, Oh, how you've grown up so fast. My heart cannot bear it. It seems like you were but a child just a day ago. Don't hold back your tears, for sorrow that is not set free soon ages and turns into bitterness. I don't want you to turn bitter, my son. Then she looked up at Glora and said, Oh, my lovely daughter-in-law, take good care of him. He has always been lonely, and I just know he feels so blessed to have you in his life. Then I said, I do. She is my everything. She is my light. Without her, I don't know where I'd go, nor who I would become. But how must I navigate this life without your wisdom? And my mother replied, My son, you and your wife have become one, therefore you do not need to latch onto me any longer. My time has come, and my heart longs to be with my husband again. Do not mourn for me. Now that I have seen you with Glora, and that you love her selflessly, I am complete. Once she finished speaking, I felt her hand grow colder. She had taken her last breath. Now I could no longer hold back the tears, so I began to weep. I buried my face in her sheets, and Glora sat beside me to comfort me, resting her head on my shoulder. After we had cried a while by her bedside, Mira and Jashra reminded us that the body must be buried. So I said to them, call the other servants, and have them purify her body, so that Glora and I may have a private funeral for her tomorrow. After this, Glora and I returned to our chamber, but I could not sleep, so Glora massaged my back till I was able to rest. The embalmers and purifiers spent the entire night purifying my mother's body in the palace basement, so that it would be ready for the funeral the next morning. I awoke around the afternoon of the next day, and I opened my eyes to see Glora looking out the window, the curtains fluttering in the wind. And she said, Today is a beautiful day, isn't it, my love? Her gorgeous hair blew in the wind, matching the movement of the curtains. When she turned to look at me with her beautiful golden eyes, I began to cry again. She came to bed and sat by me, and she held my head in her bosom, saying, I know your pain, and I am here with you. Shall we visit my father and mother today? For they too are now yours. Spending time with them may comfort you. Then I said, I will go to your parents' house, but first we must have a funeral for my mother. After Glora had comforted me for about an hour, we left our chamber to check my mother's body, to see if it was ready for the funeral. Then, when it was finished being prepared, my servants put her body in a royal casket, the same kind my father was placed in. I had my servants bring the casket to a room in one of the towers on the walls of the palace. I followed behind them with my head hung low. As we were passing through the gardens to reach the tower, the gardeners glared at me with concern, having heard the news earlier that day. We reached the tower, and I had my servants place the casket in one of the alchemy rooms, one where there was enough space. The room was dark, so Glora and I lit the room with candles, and we placed roses around the casket. Once I had set up our private funeral, I asked the servants to leave us alone. For the next few hours, Glora and I lay prostrate before my mother's casket, and I let out all my tears again. Glora also wept with me, and she wrapped her arms around me. For the entire time I laid there, she didn't let me go. I could hear Glora begin to pray to Toniel, but I couldn't hear the words over my own weeping. 
My eyes burned, and my head pounded. My chest almost failed me, and my heart sunk. After we finished mourning, in the evening, we returned to our royal chamber, and I continued to weep throughout the night. The embalmers and purifiers retrieved the casket from the room where we had the funeral, and they buried it behind the palace. Glora laid beside me in bed, and she said, My love, what I am about to say, I say out of love for you. For I love you more than my own soul. These past couple weeks, I have seen the darkness slowly rising in your heart. May we pray to Toniel together, that the light will take its place. I heeded my wife's words, because I knew they were the truth. Truly she cares for me deeply. So I said to her, I have seen it as well, my love. Let us pray before we sleep, so that Toniel may look with favor on us, and that the darkness may not continue to eat away at my soul. After we prayed fervently to Toniel, we fell asleep in each other's arms. The morning week for my mother had ended, and I arose one morning to do paperwork. While sitting there, I began to remember the things that transpired during the Battle of the Ice Sea, as well as the things which Puluvius and the Ulteran Council had done to me. So I conspired to compose a fake treaty with King Hezen of Hesbon, the capital of Panerva. Here is what I wrote in the letter, to Hezen, King of Panerva, from King Calvus of Ultira, I know you desire to conquer our land, and I understand that your kingdom has a much greater military than ours. Truly, your kingdom shall prosper. I seek to aid you in your conquering of the lands of the western continent. Altyra will be Panerva's servant, and I myself will be under your authority. Therefore, I seek to speak with you in person before your throne, and before your kingdom, to give you our peace treaty. If you would accept my request, then I will take an airship as soon as possible to reach your kingdom, and my army will be with me, to show that our entire kingdom pledges our loyalty to you and your kingdom. I stamped the letter in an envelope with my royal seal and sent it to the messengers of the palace. There they placed the letter in a carrier bag on the back of a wyvern to be taken to Panerva. I awaited King Hezen's response with great anxiety. The next day, the wyvern returned to the palace garden, carrying a letter from the king of Panerva. The letter was stamped with the seal of the kingdom of Hezbon, the capital city of Panerva. Hezen had granted us permission to come to his kingdom, and he had accepted my proposal. Immediately upon receiving and reading the letter, I spread the word, and I gathered the Ulteran army in the aerodrome to board a military airship. There I said unto my army, Be ready to fight at any moment. For I have written a faux treaty of peace, stating that I will have my kingdom bow to his. But we shall strike him down in an instant, once I have handed him the treaty. Then the army cheered, and some said, Alas, we shall exact vengeance on those that took the lives of our comrades. With that, we boarded the dreadnought Medella and took to the skies. The flight to Panerva took about a day. I was standing by the railing on the air deck, and I looked down from the clouds to see the land of Panerva. And I could see the city of Hesbon in the snowy mountains. I must admit that I quite fancied the architecture of the city from on high. Their buildings were like great towers, each having a dome on their tops, and blue lights were scattered throughout the city. And on top of one of the mountains was King Hezen's royal palace, which had a long winding path going from its entrance to the city in the valley. The airship landed in the aerodrome, which was attached to the mountain, beside the estate of the royal palace. I had my soldiers follow me off the ship and out of the aerodrome. When we stepped out into the snow as we exited the aerodrome, we were met by a squad of royal guards from the estate of Hezen's palace. They were holding large shields and spears, and they wore helmets made of sapphire stone. And they said to us, we've been expecting you. Follow us to the palace. So we followed them to King Hezen's palace, and we walked for about twenty minutes. Many of the citizens looked at us from inside their houses with confused expressions. We reached the entrance of King Hezen's palace. A great stairway led up to the doors, which were about thirty feet tall. Great pillars made of polished lapis lazuli stood on either side of the great stairway. Each pillar had intricate designs and artwork engraved on them with gold. The stairs were made with silver bricks, and two great torch bowls stood as pillars by either side of the doors. Once we reached the top of the stairs, the royal guards knocked with great force on the gate. The doors began to open, and the guards who opened them from inside said, His Majesty has been expecting you. Please, enter. And as we began to enter the palace, my bones began to burn with hatred, 
my hands eager to shed the blood of the man by whom my kingdom have suffered loss. Yet I kept my composure until I could hand him the treaty. Beyond the great doors, inside the palace, there was a great and spacious hall, and the throne which King Hezen sat on was at its end. On either side of the hall there were upper balconies, where Hezen had a multitude of his soldiers positioned, looking down on us. And on the left and the right sides of the carpet leading to the throne, Hezen's servants and the members of his royal house were eating and drinking with merry hearts. The royal guards brought us before King Hezen's throne, and my army followed behind me. Then King Hezen lowered his silver chalice, saying, Welcome to the kingdom of Hezbon, King Calvus of Altyra. When he had spoken, the entire hall became silent, and the people who were part of the feasts turned their attention towards us. Then Hezen continued, saying, I have received your letter of proposal, that you plan to sell the kingdom of Altyra to me once you have given me a peace treaty. I would read this treaty, and, assuming they are your terms of surrender, we will be willing to grant you that which you ask for, in return for handing your sovereignty over to me. Then I said, this treaty has no terms for surrender in it. Indeed, I am willing to give my kingdom over to you, so that you may look upon us with favour, and that we may not war with each other again, for both our kingdom's sakes. And Hezen said, Ah, a good man. Once I have signed your treaty, please, feel free to partake in my kingdom's fate tonight. As you can see, we are already preparing for the great feast and dance celebration that shall occur this evening. There will be joyous music and singing, for on this day my kingdom was given independence from the kingdom of Thors. I'm sure it will be a grand time, I said, as I began to approach the stairs of the throne. As I walked toward the stairs, the guards on either side halted me, saying, His Majesty will come down to take the treaty himself. But King Hezen said to them, I appreciate your concern for my safety, but if he were to try something, I would be able to defend myself. Let him come up to me. So the guards allowed me to walk up the stairs to his throne. I handed Hezen the treaty once I reached his throne, and he said, Ah, now we may add to our kingdom, and we shall prosper. No other kingdom or nation will rise above us, for we shall have dominion over both continents. And I smiled at him, saying, Indeed. Then he unsealed the scroll to open it, and I reached over to my thigh to unsheathe the dagger which I had snuck into the palace. As he was reading the treaty, I swiftly swung my dagger out and stuck it in Hezen's lung. Immediately the archers in the upper balconies aimed their arrows and fired at me, and the people attending the feasts began panicking as they scattered about. I ran down the stairs from the throne, and I dodged the countless arrows coming from above. And when I had reached the center of the hall, where my soldiers were, I shouted at them, saying, Kill every living thing here. And my soldiers began slaughtering the people of the feasts, and the archers from above began firing arrows at them as well. Now the royal guards had brought reinforcements from Hezen's barracks behind the palace, and they came running in to attack us with arc light and with the sword. But I stood in the center of the hall, and I felt the darkness pulsing through my veins. Such power a man could not contain, not even I. Before the next barrage of arrows could reach me, and before the guards could strike me, I knelt and pressed my hand on the ground. And, with a loud shout, I summoned a great barrier of umbra energy around me. The sphere of darkness engulfed all the arrows that came near me, then I shouted, and the sphere of darkness expanded outward, killing all my enemies. Suddenly it was quiet in the hall, and I turned to my soldiers and said, Go! Kill every living thing in this city and burn down every house. So my soldiers stormed out of the palace, and some of them stole the snow horses that were in the property of the royal estate, to ride them down to the city. Upon the swift snow horses did my soldiers storm into the city of the valley and they burned and pillaged the houses of the city, leaving neither woman nor child alive. And when I had reached the base of the mountain road, I looked upon the city which was set ablaze, and I smiled in my heart. Again, I felt the darkness begin to form its roots in my soul, but I had lost the will to fight against it at that point. I walked proudly upon the streets of the city, while the scent of smoke permeated the air. The soldiers who rode horses were going to and fro through the streets, swinging their swords at people as they passed them. And a few of my soldiers, who were not mounted on horses, came behind me, and said, We understand that their king has maligned the great name of Altyra, but does that warrant the amount of destruction we are bringing upon them now? Then I said to them, I feel no remorse over this endeavor of mine. For I hate this kingdom, and all that their king stood for. 
Let me alone, for I desire to purge this valley of these pests. I unsheathed my sword, and I rampaged about the city, slaughtering, and maiming every person I saw. The air was cold, but my heart boiled over with a fever of rage. Nothing would stop me from taking vengeance on Hezen's kingdom, and for the shame he hath wrought upon my kingdom. I continued my spree of destruction in the city, till devoid was the presence of life in the valley. And the army of Hezbon had been wiped out by my soldiers. After I had time to calm down, and the fever of my heart had cooled, I called out to my remaining soldiers, saying, Let us return to Altyra. My sword was stained with blood, and I cleaned it with a cloth. Then I used a stone to wet its blade. When I finished using the whetstone, I brought my army back on board the dreadnought Medella in the aerodrome. After I had wrought destruction upon the kingdom of Hesbon, rendering the land there devoid of life, I returned to the palace to lay in bed with Glora. And when I had sat beside her, she turned and said unto me, Was your trip to Panerva profitable for you? I replied, Indeed. And now the city of Hesbon is nothing but rubble and ash. I have taken just vengeance upon the kingdom that maligned us with their words and deeds. By the way, how has the council handled matters in my place while I was gone? And how have you been? And, after I said this, Glora paused, her stare fixed on me, and her countenance became sombre. So I said, what is it, my love? Then she said, the alchemists in the lower chambers visited me for their tests and found me to be pregnant. For a moment I had become speechless. Then I placed my hand on her shoulder, saying, this is something truly amazing. I know not what to say. Now during this time, and while I was taking retribution on Hezen and his kingdom, the Ulteran council was going about their scheming, as they had been doing. And that wretched man Puluvius was plotting to take over my throne while I was absent. Puluvius had made a statement to the people, and he had made a petition in the council, which was also signed by the other council members. The members of the council who signed his treaty were Magar, Iluha, Setales, Varesh, and Aranotha. Even Urka, the judge of the council, signed his petition. Glora and I were talking with each other in bed, discussing whether our child would be a boy or girl. We considered a myriad of possibilities concerning our child. And when we had left our chamber to sit on our throne, it was made known to me by my servants that there was an uproar in the city. So I had a few of my servants go outside the palace to see what was going on. When they returned, they said, Puluvius has made a petition for the people, that they will sign it if they wish to see him on the throne. He is attempting to overthrow you, to cast aside your royal lineage. In his speeches he makes to the people, he says that if the majority of them vote for him as king, then the council has the authority to make it so. Then, to my shock, Glora raised her voice, saying, how dare the council allow this to conspire. This is a kingdom, a monarchy, governed by the royal family, not a democracy. Any man who seeks to attack my husband's integrity shall suffer loss. This surprised me, because Glora never raises her voice in anger. Throughout the course of the week, the people of Altyra took heed to Puluvius' deceiving words. He fed lies to the people, that they would change their view of me. And the people listened to him, accepting his lies. The Ulteran Council supported him as well, for he was indeed one of their own members. They must not have read their own constitution, stating allegiance to the king and to the royal family, for their actions of late have been that of treason. The bitterness within me began to grow, along with the darkness. On the last day of the week, just a couple days ago, the council held a meeting for the people in the council hall. There Puluvius said unto the people as they came in, Any who would have me as king over Calvus, raise your hands to the air. Most of the people had raised their hands, in favor of making Puluvius king over me. Then Puluvius said unto them, We have heard your plea for a change in this kingdom. Then he turned to face the other members of the council who sat behind him. Then Aranotha, one of the rulers of the council, said with a loud voice, so that all in the hall could hear, You shall have your new king. Calvus shall be dethroned tomorrow morning, and this man Puluvius shall take the throne. The people cheered. Lo and behold, the next morning, the Ulteran council came to face me while I sat on the throne with Glora. Glora said to them, What brings the council inside the palace? Has the king granted them access to his throne? Then Varesh, the one leading them, replied, The throne no longer belongs to him. 
You see, the people have voted in favor of Puluvius, that the current king shall lose his kingship. Then I said, Varesh. You serve a corrupt system? Have you forgotten how this kingdom operates? I am the king. No one takes my crown. Do you see it now, Varesh? The people are not the power of the kingdom. No. Puluvius is a snake, and he wears the mask of a dove. He claims to know the way of peace, but he is a hound, barking at his master's table, begging to take his place. As I was about to finish speaking, Aranotha and Puluvius stepped out in front of Varesh. And Aranotha said, Quite a quandary this is, your highness. Many years has it been since a king has maligned a member of his own cabinet. All the more reason to have this man take your place on the throne. Glora sat up from the throne, and she had a stunned expression on her face. She was about to respond to Aranotha, but Puluvius interrupted her, saying, King Calvus, we have come to take your crown. Fight us if you feel inclined to do so, but know that you would be at war with the entire kingdom. When Puluvius had closed his mouth, I shouted at him, you would dare interrupt her. The queen's voice shall be heard. But Magar walked up beside the others as well, and said, Calvus, I place the crown on your head. Just the same, I will take it from you as well. If you do not come down from the throne and accept this, we will be forced to take drastic measures. Then I sat up from the throne, and I turned to look at my servants who stood on the right side of the hall. I said to them, what of you? Do my own servants also have such copious amounts of distrust for me in their hearts? Then they said, this is wrong. Nevertheless, we must cooperate. You are like a father to us, for we have served the royal family for ages, and never has the council sought to overthrow their own king. But the royal family does not have enough strength on its own to fight its own kingdom's military. After they had said this, they lowered their heads in shame. Magar approached my throne, then held his hand above my crown, saying, King Calvus, today the crown is taken from you, and it is given to the one who has been deemed more worthy. Your father was a great king, so do not think we are insulting the royal house. No, but we are curing it of its imperfections. And I said, gritting my teeth, why was this not brought to the court? Why has Urka accepted this, despite there being no hearing? What have I done wrong? Tell me. How does it make any sense? Magar replied, you brought destruction upon an entire kingdom, for the sole reason of satisfying your lust for revenge. How is that a reason to take my crown? Am I not the absolute authority of this kingdom? I replied. Then Aranotha compared me to the most evil king of Altyra's history, who was despicable enough that his own son wiped his name from the historical records. He said to me, the evil king Arcelox was the reason for the council's formation, so that a king so evil could never have absolute control over the people again. We are merely serving our purpose. King Marshuzafek himself gave us this authority, though he himself was king. Your time on the throne has truly made you proud. Ah, yes. Pride. The very thing your father hated. I wonder, do you think he's looking down on you with joy now? At that moment, my heart sank in my chest, and I gave up speaking with them. I had given up resisting, for I knew what was at stake. Glora could see that this was what I was thinking, and she lowered her head in shame. Together, Glora and I both arose hesitantly from our throne, and Magar took the crown off my head. Two officers from the council came to me on each side, and they took a hold of my arms. Glora also began walking down the stairs from the throne, but Aranotha said, you do not have to leave, your highness. You have done nothing wrong, aside from marrying a man such as he. I beg your pardon. What did you just say? Glora replied. Aranotha disregarded her feelings, and continued, saying, Puluvius shall be your new king. The document which you signed has been dissolved of its authority. Then she gasped, saying, of which document do you speak? And he replied, to Glora and I's dread, your marriage contract, of course. Then I turned and said to him, you can't do this. You have already taken my throne, and now you seek to take my wife from me as well? You are a horde of monsters. Duly noted, Aranotha replied. Puluvius approached Glora, saying, Queen Glora, as the new king of Altyra, I hereby order thee to marry me. Then Glora said, I would rather die. 
With that, I relinquished myself from the guard's hold, then quickly grabbed Glora's hand, and we fled from the palace. As we ran from the palace, Varish shouted at my guards, go after her. But they would not obey the council, for their loyalty has remained with the royal house for centuries. For their disobedience, Varish had two of his men take them by their necks to execute them on the spot. But they fought back, and one of my guards stuck his dagger in Varish's stomach. So Varish died there in the throne room, and there was a great uproar in the palace. From thence the other members of the council took Varish's body and left the palace. Glora and I escaped the palace safely, for they did not give us chase. We reached an alleyway in the west district, and we stayed in an open house. I am writing this in that house, and Glora and I have been recounting all the things that have taken place. The darkness boils and stirs in my heart, and I am shaking as I write this. This may be the last time I write something in this journal, though I have kept it since I was young. Now Glora and I plan to leave this land, and we plan to live on Pyra, where we may raise our child in peace. I am Paul Lux, and I am writing this to give an account of what happened before King Calvus went into exile on Pyra with his wife Glora. This is not one of Calvus' journal entries, but I have found his thirteen entries left behind in the house he and his wife were staying in before they left Arden. King Puluvius had been on the throne for about a month's time, and Calvus and Glora were living in the house they had escaped to. It was evening, and Puluvius was sitting on the throne. Calvus and Glora had been sleeping in their house in the West District since that afternoon, and Calvus had been depressed, for he missed the palace, the home he had grown up in, where the memories of his father and mother were. That evening, when the lamp poles lighting the streets had grown dim, Calvus rose from Glora's side, who was still sleeping, and he snuck about the alleys of the living quarters. And when he had come to the main street which leads to the entrance of the palace, he paced himself quickly along the sidewalk. As soon as he reached the entrance, the guards who stood there stopped him with their halberds. Calvus unsheathed his dagger with haste, and the two guards fell. Then Calvus entered the palace and approached the throne. Puluvius said to him, as he began walking up the stairs to the throne, Calvus. What are you doing here? And once he could see the murderous intent in his eyes, he shouted, Guards! Seize him! He's gone mad! The guards standing on either side of the throne came to seize him, but he immediately broke free from their hold, and he slashed their necks with his blade. Puluvius rose from the throne, and was about to call for more guards, but Calvus stabbed him through the chest, and he choked on his own blood. Puluvius' blood flowed like a stream down the stairs to the throne, and Calvus twisted the blade in his chest. Calvus left the blade in his chest, and he ran to escape the palace. The other guards then chased him throughout the city street, and when he made it to the house, Glora had awoken, and he brought her with him to escape the kingdom of Altyra. The guards quit their pursuit once they had reached a ten-mile distance from the walls of the city. From there, Calvus and Glora began living in the mountains of Grianara, and they lived in Thasha, the capital city. In the center of the city of Thasha there is a great rift gate, which you must pay a toll to use, and the price varies for each rift plane. Calvus and Glora paid for a Pyran rift crystal, which took them through the rift gate to the rift plane Pyra. There they remained for the rest of their days. And when Glora had given birth to her child, Calvus saw that it was a boy, and he named him Icarus. So the line of the Frasier family would continue, and Icarus was the first Frasier to not be a king of Altyra. Now I have finished compiling the journal entries of King Calvus, the 27th king of Altyra. Though he fell to the darkness at the end of his rule, whether he has changed his heart and chosen to follow the light is unknown to me. The legacy of Calvus will live on, whether for better or for worse.